Hello, my name is William Waterway. And today I'm going to present to you a new definition for Earth's water cycle. I am honored to participate in this international symposium on aqua science, water resources, and the arts. I give thanks to the symposium's founder, Dr. Yamasaki, and to West Marin for producing this event. I also would like to give special thanks to NASA and to the United States Geological Service for their illustrations, and to MVTV for production assistance. The material I am presenting today will inform you about the new definition for the water cycle. The old definition for the water cycle does not include two other phases of the water cycle. It only includes one phase, which is the atmospheric water cycle, and does not include current scientific research. The new definition for the water cycle, which we call the waterway cycle, to differentiate it from the old, is based on current scientific research data, and most importantly, includes information about the three interactive cycles, the cosmic water cycle, the atmospheric water cycle, and the oceanic water cycle. What you see behind me is basically the old water cycle, the one that you are all familiar with. So what we have is we have evaporation from Earth, and this evaporation takes place from all the surface bodies of water on Earth, and it is a system that is driven by the heat of the sun's energy. We have evaporation of water from surface bodies. We have also evapotranspiration from plants. And we have sublimation, which is the evaporation of water vapor directly from the surfaces of ice and snow, which makes a very small contribution. But as you know, which we've all been taught through school, that there is evaporation, there's condensation as the water vapor cools in the upper atmosphere. And then we have precipitation. And precipitation comes down as rainfall, sleet, snow, fog. We have the accumulation of ice and snow in the upper altitudes. We also have runoff in rivers. And then also we have storage of the water from the atmospheric water cycle underground. And this cycle continuously repeats itself over and over again. Now this cycle was first given to us by Bernard Palissy. Bernard Palissy was a Frenchman and in his book, Admirable Discourses, he defines the water cycle that I've just explained here. And this is the water cycle that has been taught in schools for over 430 years. Now, as I explained in the beginning, the new definition of the waterway cycle encompasses the cosmic cycle, the atmospheric cycle, and the oceanic cycle. Now, when I say the oceanic cycle, it's kind of curious because people say to me, William, you know, what is the oceanic cycle? Where there's evaporation of water from the ocean. It goes up into the upper atmosphere and returns. I said, no, I said, aren't you aware that there's an oceanic cycle where all the water in the ocean goes down toward the middle of the earth and gets recycled and over and over again? And they look at me as if um, perhaps I'm 
putting them on or uh, is a fantasy of mine, but no, we know now through modern science that our ocean is, all the world's oceans are completely recycled and that approximately every seven million years, we have a new ocean where all the water in the ocean is completely recycled approximately every seven million years. Now, why is this important? Certainly, if all the water in the ocean is being recycled, certainly that is a very, very important component of Earth's water cycle, isn't it? So, to elaborate on this, what we have here is the ocean and deep in the ocean, we have the pressure from up above, we have gravity pulling, we have the pressure up above from all the weight of the ocean, and we also have plate tectonics. All of these things are involved in the oceanic cycle. So what happens? The plate tectonics we have, by the way, plate tectonics was something that was discovered approximately 45 to 50 years ago, relatively new to our thinking. So we have the water deep in the ocean and we have plate tectonics where the plate moves toward the oceanic plate here, here's the ocean bed, moves toward the continent, comes into contact with the continent and it subducts. We call this a zone of subduction. Now this ocean floor is saturated with water, impregnated deep, deep, deep with water, oceanic water. So this subducts, it goes down beneath the continent and then it get, picks up the convection. This is, this is the core of the earth. It's the heat of the core of the earth that drives the oceanic cycle. So here we have the subduction of all this water, oceanic water, and what happens? It comes up underneath the continent. It comes up in the form of volcanoes. The hot magma, by the way, it needs superheated water, superheated oceanic water, melts the rock up above in the Earth's mantle, and then comes up as a volcano, or perhaps as a steam vent, or such as the Rift Valley in Africa, it'll come up and actually cause the continent to split. Now, looking over here, what do we have? We have, coming up here, the hot magma from Earth's core. Again, this is oceanic water that is superheated. It comes up and comes up into the bottom of the ocean and creates what we call a divergent ridge. So the hot magma comes up, by the way, I'm sure you've all seen it on television. We have the black smokers and the white smokers with all these ethereal looking life forms. That's where they occur, right here in these ridges where the steaming hot magma comes up. And this creates what we call an oceanic ridge and it splits the ocean in the bottom of the ocean, the floor bed of the ocean goes into two different directions. <clears throat> so here we have the, the floor of the ocean going toward the continent in this direction, and over here the floor of the bottom of the ocean going toward the continent in another direction. So this is a cycle of ocean water going down to the core of the earth and then coming back up. Now what does this do? What does this mean? Well, what it means is that all the water that is coming from the bottom of the ocean and getting circulated down to the core of the earth continuously recycles. It comes up through these oceanic ridges, through underwater volcanoes, and also up onto the surface of the earth through volcanoes. And when a volcano explodes, the plume that we see is made up mostly of water vapor. So in this fashion, we have oceanic water being returned to the atmospheric water cycle. And down here, we have oceanic water that gets taken down to the center of the earth being recycled back up to the ocean. So this is why we call this the oceanic cycle. Now, don't forget now, 
Plate tectonics was something that was discovered only about 45 to 50 years ago. So this is a relatively new discovery for humankind. <clears throat> and there's also another phenomenon, which I won't go into too deeply today, but if you ever get out to Yellowstone National Park, and again, remember I referred to those black smokers and those white smokers with all of those weird looking life forms? They are making a contribution to the ecosystem of the earth. And it is vital. This circulatory pattern of our oceans is vital for the ongoing health of our oceans. If we did not have this oceanic cycle to renew our oceans, our oceans basically would be dead today. We would not have the biodiversity, or perhaps we would not even have the life on Earth that we have today. Perhaps there would be no life. Perhaps we, we would be a dead planet. So moving along, now we're going to explore the cosmic cycle. I mean, what a revelation it was for us to go up into outer space and to take that first photograph of Earth. And there we see that glow. It's almost an aura of Earth's thin atmosphere that protects us from the deadly rays of space, from our sun, and from the deep, cold vacuum of space. That thin atmosphere is what protects us. And that thin atmosphere is also what makes up the biosphere and is the atmospheric water cycle. Moving along. So behind me you see a satellite photograph of the Leonid meteor shower. Now the curious thing about meteorites, we would see them as shooting stars uh, once in a while. They would be witnessed um, through various periods of history, humankind's history. They would end up being in illustrations, paintings, notes would be made about them in records when we had recorded history. Sometimes you would see drawings of them uh, in the pyramids, uh, in the various areas of the pyramids where you have petroglyphs. So they've been something that humankind has witnessed for a long time. Now we thought that meteorites, sure they make nice shooting stars, but we never ever imagined after flying through space that meteorites were actually carrying water to Earth. It was only approximately 20 years ago, in fact it was exactly in 1999, when a meteorite landed in Texas and scientists looked into the heart of that meteorite and they discovered extraterrestrial water. Now since then, of course, once we made that discovery, we've looked at a lot of other meteorites and we have found extraterrestrial water in a lot of other meteorites. Now these meteorites, besides carrying water to Earth, they also carry what we call nucleobases. Nucleobases are the building blocks for life, such as amino acids. And there are various theories as to how these building blocks of life coming to Earth throughout time and in modern history may alter the biodiversity of Earth's ecosystems. Now, when it comes to comets, the tail of a comet is mostly made up of water vapor. However, what we see when a comet is passing by in our solar system, we see the dust reflecting the rays of the sun. However, most of this tail is carrying water vapor that is evaporated by the solar wind that hits the comet. Now, it has been guesstimated by science that over 100 thousand billion dust particles from comets come to Earth each year. Now this is a significant number. What does this mean to us? You know, 
whenever um, I'm at a presentation or when I'm listening to a presentation, I'm always saying, well, what does this mean to me? Uh, well, in order for raindrops to form, there has to be a nucleus. And we have discovered that the uh, nuclei for raindrops can be dust particles, can be salt particles from evaporated salt water that has been thrown up high into the atmosphere. It could be bacteria, it could be pollen, it could be pollutants, but we need a nucleus. So when we have over 100,000 billion dust particles coming from comets into Earth's atmosphere, they would be surrounded potentially by molecules of water and form the nucleus of raindrops, which of course comes down to our Earth. And it has been, again, theorized that biomolecules from comets come into Earth's water cycle in this fashion. <clears throat> now, relative to comets and delivery of water on Earth, there are many theories relative to how water came to Earth. And the one that has been standing for the longest has been that as Earth cooled, it outgassed the water that was stored inside and created our oceans. But more recently, especially in the past few weeks, with the discovery of Comet Hartley 2, we discovered that the chemical signature of the water on this comet almost exactly matches the water that we have in our oceans on Earth. So therefore, the scientists and the theorists are leaning more toward thinking that the water that we have on Earth today came from a bombardment of comets and meteorites from outside of Earth and it was delivered to Earth in one huge bombardment that occurred many, many billions of years ago. So now to wrap our minds around the entire cosmic cycle, not only do we have water coming to Earth from meteorites and comets, we also are losing water into outer space on a daily basis. Now what happens is that water molecules, either through an uplifting from a volcano, um, convection along a mountain ridge, perhaps a hurricane, or a tropical storm along the equator, but we have very strong uplifting influences. And this carries water molecules up into the upper, upper atmosphere. And there it can be separated into its basic constituents of oxygen and hydrogen and we lose the hydrogen to outer space and we basically reduce the amount of water vapor in Earth's atmospheric cycle. Now this is only a minuscule amount, but in fact we do lose water to outer space each day, every year, and have for billions of years. So there are scientists who are much better versed in this subject than I am, and they have come up with a, an equation that explains how much water we lose to space. Water lost to space. Current science estimates that five times 10 to the 11th grams of Earth's water is lost to space each year. This brings the total amount of water lost to space since the beginning of our Earth's history to about two times 10 to the 21st power of grams of water are about 0.2% of the water in all of Earth's oceans. So what does this say? We are losing water to outer space and we are gaining water from outer space. This means that the cosmic cycle, which is part of the three interactive cycles for the waterway cycle, is an open system that the waterway cycle with the cosmic cycle where water comes to us from space and is lost to space, the atmospheric cycle which circulates the water, and the oceanic cycle that completely recycles our ocean water. 
So it is an open system from the core of the Earth out to the outer limits of our atmosphere and all the way out into the universe. Moving along. So we call this the waterway cycle. Again, it's called the waterway cycle to differentiate it from the old water cycle definition. The waterway cycle, here we are gaining water from outer space, from meteorites, and from comets. Here we are losing water to outer space in the upper reaches of Earth's atmosphere. And then we have the circulation of Earth's water in the atmospheric cycle that then connects with the cosmic cycle. And then we have the oceanic cycle where the, all the water in the world's oceans are recycled. And every ocean on Earth, by the way, has this oceanic ridge system that connects its water with the core of the Earth. So every ocean on Earth has this circulatory pattern where it is completely renewed approximately every seven million years. And again, this is vital for the health of the oceans and vital for the survival of life on Earth. <clears throat> so I wanted to thank you for following me along on this journey for this new definition of the Earth's water cycle. Again, we call this the waterway cycle. And it is something that I feel is important to be taught in schools so that young people today can wrap their minds around the entire cycle of water, the way water moves from outer space to the inner core of our planet. You know, when I give this presentation before people, at the end, many people from the audience often come up to me, some of them months later, and they'll say, William, and these are especially sailors, people that are around water a lot. They say, William, I cannot look at the ocean with the same eyes. It's, they look at the ocean and now they see an ocean that is recycled to the core of Earth. They cannot look at the night sky with the same eyes. When they see a meteorite, which we call shooting stars, they think of meteorites right now, today, bringing water, extraterrestrial water, to Earth. So it basically opens their minds to a new reality when they look at this world that we live in each day. One of the components of this symposium is the artistic element. So now that we have reviewed the waterway cycle from the scientific perspective, now we will explore the artistic perspective. As a poet and a Native American flute artist, I have put together a poem as well as composed a Native American flute song. These are very similar to what I presented at the United Nations, as well as the National Geographic Water for Life production, in which I spoke and played the flute and read poetry, uh, since I am one of the authors for the National Geographic book on water. This poem is called The Water Way. Our water cycles definition over 430 years ago was first found. Now we have new information that truly does astound. The new definition of the waterway cycle tells the story of how three interactive phenomena circulate water in ways most profound, of how the oceanic cycle creates a new ocean every seven million years, of how our ocean waters flow deep, deep down and around and around and around, where superheated water vents up into our oceans, where superheated water vents up 
unto our continents. Steaming volcanoes and earthquakes too, all vital to life, including to me and to you. This new definition we call the waterway cycle also tells water's story with a new cosmic angle of how our water is lost into outer space, of how cosmic rain falls into this sacred place, of how our waterway cycle is an open system connecting us with our creator's infinite universe so we may embrace our waters with divine wisdom in our actions, prose, music, and poetic verse. Now in closing, I'm going to transition to the Native American flute. And I call this waterway sunrise because behind me you will see a film that was done here in Martha's Vineyard from behind my home of the sun rising over the ocean to the east. I give thanks to my flute teacher, R. Carlos Nikai, for his inspiration. Historically, Native Americans used the flute in their water rituals and to communicate with water. In this flute song that I've entitled Waterway Sunrise, you will hear high notes that represent the cosmic water cycle. You will hear mid notes that represent the atmospheric water cycle, as well as you will hear rapid notes, rapidamente, that represent the rapids of rivers and the turbulence in our oceans. And you will hear mellow notes that represent the calm waters of our planet. And you will hear deep notes for those waters that submerge deep beneath our planet. And finally, you will hear rumbling and explosive notes that represent earthquakes and volcanoes. Again, this flute song is similar to the one I played after my presentation at the United Nations. And after my presentation at the International National Geographic Water is Life event, which launched a book entitled Written in Water, in which I am one of the authors. So please, take a deep breath. Sit back and enjoy this flute journey. <laughs> 